Hey, what's up, DEF CON? This is Cedric Owens. I'm super humbled and excited to be here. And I'll be talking about uh, basically giving a perspective of what red teaming looks like uh, in macOS environments here in the year 2021. Uh, some background information on myself. I'm a full-time offensive security engineer on the red team side, and I've been dedicated red teamer now for the past four, almost five years. Prior to that, um, vast majority of my career has been on the blue team side doing incident response, threat detection, threat hunting, both in the Intel community and in the private sector. And so even as a full-time red teamer now, I highly value collaborating with blue team just to help uplift each other's trade craft and move the needle forward in our organizations. I personally enjoy macOS post exploitation as an interest area of mine, that and infrastructure automation. So whenever I do have free time, I'm typically working on projects that, that fit into one of those two buckets. Also, as an early 80s baby, I do enjoy 80s and 90s nostalgia, such as what you see here in the picture. Just reminds me a lot of my childhood, and it's even cooler now to see my kids uh, playing with a lot of these same toys or watching these same shows, and it's just kind of cool to see the legacy of these things live on. I am on Twitter, uh, handle at Seth Owens, where occasionally I'll post blog posts or tools that may be of interest, so check that out. If that's of interest to you. So what I plan to talk about today, uh, first one being, uh, why do we even care about Mac OS, especially in a Windows centric world? Uh, why are we even here for this talk? Uh, overviews of common tech environments and what the tech stacks look like in organizations that are heavy Mac users. Uh, options for Mac OS payloads and post exploitation and a look at how the different options you pick usually will have a pro and a con associated with it. Uh, we'll also look at other attack vectors, so things in macOS environment that become attack targets that may not themselves necessarily be macOS, but you'll find them often in macOS environments. And then we'll end off talking about detection opportunities to look at from a blue team perspective. So again, first question is macOS, why do we care? And to your point, if you're asking that question, most uh, Fortune 500 companies today are still Windows shops. And uh, you may find there that maybe 90% of their endpoints are Windows, maybe five Mac, five like Linux or, or Chromebooks. Uh, but in the, there's a sliver of companies in the San Francisco Bay Area, your Silicon Valley companies, that are basically the opposite, where you may find 80 to 90% of the endpoints being Mac, may, may find uh, five, or five to 10% or somewhere around there being Windows endpoints, and you may have Chromebook and Linux mixed in. So essentially, it's the flip of what you'll see uh, in your Fortune 500 environments. It makes it for an interesting environment uh, to assess from an attacker's perspective because there's often a mentality, well, if we're not an enterprise Windows shop, then we're more secure. And I can understand the line of thinking there, but it really depends on how you implement your Mac slash cloud environment. Uh, in other words, if you have keys laying around at or in code repos or other easy places for an attacker to find, you may find that even though you've migrated off of a uh, Windows Enterprise environment, your environment can still be easily compromised. So we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. It is a slowly growing trend that, at least that I've been seeing, where newer companies are adopting more of a not quote unquote non Windows Enterprise environment. And what I've noticed is that Active Directory is typically going to be there because it usually is the best LDAP solution for enterprises. So even in these environments, you will have Active Directory, which will be used to back your authentication. But just your typical end-to-end -end enterprise uh, rollout of Windows will be different here. And I like it, too, because it allows, as a red teamer, it allows you to point out different vectors that really have nothing to do with Active Directory and compromising domain controllers but other very interesting vectors that can still be impactful and in some cases devastating to your organization. So I think it's a very interesting environment from a red team perspective. So first we're gonna look at common tech stacks and what you might encounter in a common uh, tech company in a Silicon Valley area. Uh, first thing is there's a concept of realms or environments. And so you may have a corporate environment, a dev or stage environment, production environment. And so here's an example, uh, we'll walk from left to right, where you may have employees that remote in using an identity as a service solution. 
Two common uh, IDAS solutions are Okta and OneLogin, where the employee authenticates with their username, password, and a 2FA token, which is usually going to be like a Okta Verify push or Duo push to their mobile devices. Once they log in, they're now inside of their identity as a service portal, and they have access to a lot of different productivity applications like uh, email. You may have Atlassian products like uh, Jira. You may have Salesforce, internal Git, even custom application servers, all accessible to the user based on their roles in Active Directory. Then you also, on the production side, you may find a combination of cloud-based production hosts and on-prem. And you may find a, a lot of different things there, but typically in production, you're gonna find like your customer-ready code and maybe even customer data that's stored here. And you're gonna find things like your build hosts, your CICD pipeline, you may find some uh, cloud hosted services and servers there. You may find HashiCorp for managing application secrets. Uh, and of course, you may have some on-prem stuff. You may have Jenkins on-prem or even in the cloud. We have some Windows servers, segmented environment of Windows servers there. So a lot of different things going on here and it makes it interesting because of course there's a lot of complexities and sometimes with more complexities comes more opportunities from an attacker perspective. Uh, another thing to point out is on the bottom left, I have rough percentages over the different endpoints. So like I'm showing Mac OS being 80% and Windows being 15 and Google uh, Chromebooks being 5%. It's just a rough, rough numbers there. Some organizations, you may actually find Mac being higher or closer to 90% and the Windows population being even smaller. So it's interesting because with Mac being such a high, uh, high percentage of endpoints in tech environments, and engineers using their Macs often to either do dev work locally on a Mac or log into like a cloud hosted uh, server or an application server or Jumpbox uh, from other places that they can do their development work from there. You typically may find that there are sensitive keys, tokens, credentials, things like that that are stored on the endpoint. So uh, really end to end, this makes for a very interesting environment to assess from an attacker's perspective. Uh, next, I'm going to talk quickly about some different ways that Mac OS uh, is deployed from an enterprise perspective. Uh, one option is like custom deployment where you hire your own team and they build out some custom solution to manage and hook into Macs and control them and push policies, etc. And, and leap, basically loop back into your LDAP solution. Uh, organizations that do that custom tend to be maybe like your, your big five in tech, so something like your Apple or your Facebook, Google may, may all be custom, where they have the money, the resources to throw at that. But typically what I find is outside of the big five, most organizations in the Silicon Valley area, most companies there tend to use a, a solution that they purchase, such as Jamf Pro, which is really the most common that I've encountered, but I also notice uh, products, other products that are up and coming like Kanji, and uh, so we're going to take a look at those. I uh, also wanted to point out Caleb Hall and Luke Roberts in their Black Hat, Black Hat talk this year did a really good talk on abusing Jamf for remote management and how an attacker can leverage that to control and compromise uh, managed Macs in an enterprise environment. So highly recommend checking that out. So there's a very high level overview of common Jamf deployments that you may see. You have, typically have an admin server. If you're in an environment that uses Jamf, you can run Jamf check JSS connection from terminal and that will return the URL to your Jamf admin server. Uh, you also have your endpoints, which have the Jamf agent on them that receives the configurations for the admin server. You also have self-service that runs on the endpoints and allows users to install software versions that their IT department has already vetted. So essentially they don't have to open tickets for these, they can just install them from self-service. Really nifty way of doing things. Also, Jamf does include the ability to have remote management where admins can remote in to do screen sharing or other troubleshooting on the endpoints. And typically that is through an admin account that has SSH access into the endpoints. Oftentimes, from what I've seen in enterprise Mac OS environments, SSH is enabled on the endpoints and, and uh, the IT team will use an account that can SSH in and it has pseudo rights on the uh, Mac OS host where they can perform administration. So that's a very common thing that I've seen in environments. And of course, one thing to, to be aware of is if that is, if that is uh, how your environment is set up, it becomes very similar to 
the problem on a Windows side years ago about dealing with SMB and local admin passwords and like laps coming out being a solution to randomize those passwords. Well, the same thing would apply here if remote management's being used. Is it like is it a static password or is there random password being used? And of course, if it's static password, then that means if you get that password, you can now access any Mac in the environment over SSH with pseudo rights. And SSH has full disk access, so it bypasses privacy protection. So that could be really bad for the environment. So just something to think about there. Another thing, another uh, aspect to look at here is if you run as a red team or you run a phishing exercise and you target Jamf admins, uh, which is usually a uh, Active Directory group in your environment that limited people have access to that the organization has identified to administer Jamf. And you, you fish them, you gain access to their Active Directory credentials, and then you use those credentials uh, to log into the Jamf management server, Jamf admin server. And depending on your environment, like that, that admin server may be behind Okta where 2FA push is required, or it may not, it may just be locally in your environment without 2FA. And you can get access that way. And then from there, you can start to push policies and scripts to run on the endpoints. And really, there you almost, you essentially do have full control over your Mac OS environment. So this is something an attack path to think about as well if you're in an enterprise Mac environment. But now, even when it comes to Jamf, there's really, there's really uh, so many different ways to implement Jamf. There's really no one way to do it. So we're just going to look at a few examples. First example is probably the simplest, where Mac OS hosts are bound directly uh, to AD. And in that case, you can run like, different DSCL or LDAP search commands to pull AD information directly from the domain controllers, just as you can on the Windows side, like for example, with net user uh, commands like that. You, know, you can do the same here. And tools such as MacHound, which is a, a Mac OS port of Bloodhound, or Cody Thomas's Bifrost, which does Kerberos manipulation, those tools would work and apply in this environment since the host, the Mac OS hosts are bound directly to Active Directory and can query them directly. Another example is via uh, access via a tool called Nomad, where in this case, Mac OS hosts are not bound directly to AD. So if you try to query Active Directory from these hosts, you won't be able to reach it directly that way. And essentially, the user logs in locally with a local account, and then they do network authentication for access, for access to resources, which is where Nomad comes in. And that uh, Nomad then performs Kerberos authentication on their behalf. And so uh, and this, if, if this setup is how your environment is configured, then there are files that you can read from that you might find interesting on an assessment, uh, such as like different P lists that I have mentioned here. Also, uh, things like KList, KCC, Cody Thomas's Bifrost tool that does Kerberos man manipulation, those tools would still work since Kerberos is still happening from your endpoint. So something to think about there. Another example, same setup or similar setup here where your Mac OS endpoints do not have direct access to Active Directory to query domain controllers directly. In this case, they have Jamf Connect on them and Jamf Connect is synced through Okta, and Okta does the syncing with Active Directory when it comes to authentication. And so uh, like a federated model there. And what's interesting here is like, just in this example, the Active Directory controllers are, uh, domain controllers are uh, walled off by like firewall rules or VPN access, maybe a specific VPN profile that you need. So again, if you try to query directly, uh, this would not work. But if this were, um, how your environment's set up, there still are some interesting plists and files on the system that you could pull from to learn more about the host and the environment that you're in, such as what's here, the uh, two files highlighted above. So uh, as I mentioned, AD is still present in macOS environments, but it just looks a little bit different from what you see in your enterprise Windows environments. And I enjoy it because it gives me a chance to focus on something else outside of Active Directory. And of course, when you're in these types of environments, they're heavy Mac and cloud implementations. So a lot of interesting things to look at. So let's, let's talk about that. First, we're going to talk about initial access. In this case, targeting our, targeting our identity as a service portal. So uh, the two most common are Okta and OneLogin. A uh, tool that, that is pretty popular here is Evil Jinx 2 by Kuba Gretzky. And what it does is you point it to a target login portal 
it clones that portal. And as and you basically send out a link to the fake portal, and as people log into the fake Okta or fake one login portal, it captures the username, password, and it authenticates it to the actual site and does the same thing for your 2FA token. So then the attacker is able to grab the token for Okta or for one login, uh, import it into their browser using uh, a plugin like edit this cookie, and now you're the compromised user. And what's so interesting about this attack path is once you're inside of someone's uh, identity as a service portal, you have access to a ton of different productivity apps. So you got Slack, think about the credentials, uh, configuration files, uh, secrets, things that people have shared in Slack that may be pinned in different channels. Think about Gmail or Google Drive. Uh, people may email themselves passwords so they don't forget or, or sensitive information. Um, you can you have access to search all of that. Imagine like your Confluence, uh, your Jira tickets, things that, that may have interesting data there, or Wiki, all sorts of juicy information there. And as a red teamer, you may opt to take this path and essentially meet your objectives without ever even needing to land access on a Mac OS endpoint. So this is definitely worth running in your environment from both a red and a blue team perspective. And one of the big wins for from the blue team side is allowing basically running through your procedures to see if you have visibility into this attack path. And if you do, do you have the ability to revoke um, compromised tokens? Because in this case, password resets are great, but if you don't revoke the compromised token, you're not gonna be able to boot out the attacker. So a good way to test your um, detection and response procedures. So I mentioned a lot of interesting data in your productivity portals. And there are some tools that people have written to actually automate this if you're using this from a red team uh, attack perspective. Uh, one being a colleague of mine, Antonio Piazza, he wrote a few different what I call thief tools of GD, GDIR, and Conf Thief to uh, simulate or speed up downloading sensitive files from those platforms. Also a colleague of mine, Brad Richardson over at Credit Karma, wrote a tool called Slackhound that does a similar thing if you find a Slack token on a host. You just feed it and it uses uh, API calls and things of that nature to pull down data as well as a uh, Slack pirate. So a lot of uh, di different and interesting attack paths on this vector. So now we talked about identity as a service briefly. I'm going to pivot over to the Mac OS side of the house and talk about some of the basics around Mac OS from a security perspective. I like to break it into three different areas, uh, prevention, detection and removal. Uh, Gatekeeper on the prevention side is essentially the engine that, or, or the, the, I guess you say the service with SysPolicy D is behind it as the engine that evaluates certain file types like application bundles, star packages, macos, etc. It looks for files that have a com.apple.quarantine attribute appended to them, which the operating, operating system appends for any files downloaded from the internet. So if a file is of the, of the types that uh, Gatekeeper evaluates, such as macos, apps install, packages, et cetera, and it has that quarantine attribute, then Gatekeeper enforcement kicks in. It checks to see if it's signed and if it's notarized. And if not, it will block it from running. If it does, it still does a pop-up. But what's, what's of interest here is that even for non-signed, non-notarized, like app packages, installers, macro binaries, et cetera, the user can still right-click open and, and click through one other uh, prompt to run it despite Gatekeeper. On the detection side, you have uh, XProtect, which is also part of Gatekeeper, and it's really more of the malware definitions and blacklisting that I guess you can say comes from like Apple Intel, from real world, real world malware resources um, or malware sources that they have uh, analyzed. And then you, you have the malware removal tool, MRT.app, and that does the remediation. From a red team perspective, the prevention side of it really is the hardest uh, hurdle to overcome. Xprotect and MRT.app usually are not much, usually not big factors for red teamers because we tend to write our own stuff for Mac OS since it's kind of a niche space. And since Xprotect and MRT.app tend to look at existing samples for their Intel, usually when you write your own stuff, those, those two aspects become less of a factor. It's just really gatekeeper that becomes the the pain and headache from a red team perspective. Other things to think about is the concept of TCC or privacy protection. So and that essentially you have certain folders or certain places on disk that uh, 
uh, TCC protects. So you have things like the user's desktop documents, downloads, uh, all sorts of other places on the system that TCC protects. Uh, what's of interest, though, are things that are not protected. So the home directory itself uh, and within the home directory, certain other subdirectories like a .ssh or .aws directory, both of those would contain credentials. And uh, the ability, if they're captured, to, to provide lateral movement. Uh, temp directory is also not protected, which is why malware typically is dropped there. So just something to think about because, again, if TCC is enforced, a pop-up will show to the user where they can allow or deny if like that directory is requested. But for not protected folders, uh, there's no notification to the user and access is not prevented at all by TCC if it's not protected by TCC. Uh, the Evil Bit and Reggie did an excellent Black Hat talk this year on 20 different ways to bypass TCC. So definitely check that out. They'll dig way more uh, into what TCC is and different methods for bypassing. So check that out. From an initial access perspective on Mac, a lot of different options here and they all have different pros and cons. You have your Mako binaries, which are checked by Gatekeeper, but you typically need a delivery method because most of the time your Makos are not gonna be double click friendly. I mean, there are some tricks you can do, but just generally speaking, you'll, you'll use your Mako as a second stage payload. Uh, apps are checked by Gatekeeper. They're pretty remote friendly because again, they're, they're app packages and they're double clicked usually. And so um, they are remote friendly, but they are checked by Gatekeeper. Star packages are also checked and remote friendly uh, that allow users to double click. You got uh, weaponized PDFs, uh, shell script trickeration, which we'll talk about later. Uh, essentially, that is a bug that I found in uh, Gatekeeper this year and reported to Apple and worked with them to get it fixed. Um, you also have your scripting languages that are not checked by Gatekeeper. Things are such as JXA, which is JavaScript for automation. Cody Thomas did an excellent job a couple years back of highlighting how powerful JXA is on Mac and how it's essentially like an Apple script alternative. Um, and and some, it's, it's kind of interesting because sometimes I view JXA as like the replacement for Apple script, but they're both still around and they'll probably both be around for a while. Of course, Python is not checked by Gatekeeper. However, Mac or Apple will remove Python from base Mac OS installs at some point in the future. We don't know when, but from an attacker's perspective, it's just something to keep in mind if you're heavily relying on Python. Uh, Office macros are not checked by Gatekeeper, but it is sandbox, meaning uh, it will be, if you gain access remotely via Office macro, you only have access to certain parts of the disk and certain binaries, et cetera. So a lot of different uh, options here. You've got Apple Script browser, browser extensions. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out was that on uh, Mac OS, uh, Doomfist LeoPit wrote a really neat tool called Mystical that is a payload generator for several of these types of payloads where you can provide an information that will generate the payload for you. I uh, also wanted to point out Mythic by Cody Thomas at Specter Ops is what I consider at this stage to be the king of Mac OS command and control because of its innovative use of JXA and has a lot of other cool um, features with how it's built and how it's managed. So definitely check that out from a red and blue perspective. Uh, quickly gonna jump into some different examples. So the first example being installer packages and I'm gonna briefly talk about script only because they're, they're the most common and a pretty simple example here. But you have a pre-install and a post-install script and both require the shebang at the top and exit at the end in order to run successfully. Uh, they run as child processes of the installer packages, so whatever scripts um, you have running. And it runs elevated as root from an attacker's perspective, which is a nice plus because any installer package that a user detonates and uh, to install, they end up authenticating. And usually in macOS environments, the user is local admin, so when they authenticate, uh, that installs with elevated or root access on the host. Uh, as I mentioned before, it is checked, installer packages are checked by Gatekeeper, but they can right click and open. And that's a common technique that's used in the, in the wild with uh, real world malware samples. So Patrick Wardle and um, Objective-C have a lot of good examples of like real world malware samples for Mac OS. And you can look through their Mac, their Mac malware reports of 2020 and 2019, et cetera, and look for different examples for how uh, these types of things are done, like an image is included and the user is instructed to right click and press open in order to run a non-signed, non-notarized installer package.
Here's an example, uh, pre-install script. So we talked about pre-install and post-install. This is an example on the pre-install side that essentially just pulls down a unsigned, un, uh, non-notarized Mako binary, writes it to the temp folder and sets the executable bit. On the bottom is an example with us being remote these days and so many employees being from home. This is an example of how you could add a guard row in there to check for the host name to ensure that it's not running on someone's personal machine, but on a corporate machine. If it's found to be running on a personal machine, it will exit. If not, then it will perform the, the pull down of the payload and set the executable bit. And here's an example of a post install script where it just runs the um, Mako binary background. It. So once you have that set up, you can just run this package build command here to generate the package, host it, get it to the user, they detonate it, they authenticate, they basically double click and authenticate through the installation and it detonates in the background. And as you can see at the bottom here, this is my mythic, a screenshot of my mythic C2 server um, and the, de the payload detonated as root level access. Another example, you have app bundles or app packages where you have the app uh, the name of it with content slash Mac OS and then a, a Mako binary at the bottom. And so to do this, a very simple way you could go into Xcode, create a new project. Uh, my example, I'm using Swift here. And if, then you would design a window with buttons, icons, text, etc., for a user to interact with. Once you have that designed uh, and ready to go, you go into info.plist for any tr app transport security. So app transport security are restrictions on Apple to limit the types of outbound connections that app packages can make. So if you're trying to talk out to like a, a non HTTPS server, so just plain HTTP, there's certain entries you have to put in there to allow that. And even if you're talking to an SSL server, it does not like self signed certificates. So you actually have to get a valid signed certificate for that to work. Uh, and then of course you set your sandbox accordingly, or the settings there that you need, and you can add code like here below that uses a dispatcher, and again, this is Swift, as a background task to execute a JXA payload that's hosted on a server. And here's an example of the window that you could design for the user to interact with. And as you can see, it can be very convincing. And the user clicks update now, then the mythic uh, command and control uh, server receives a callback from the user. So again, uh, app packages are checked by Gatekeeper, but as you can see here, um, as I mentioned, same with install packages, same with here, you can right click and open. So here's an example from the Schlayer, which is a common Mac OS malware family that's been around for a while of a simple image to social engineer the user into right clicking and opening to run an unsigned uh, non-notarized uh, app package. Of course you have uh, Microsoft Office macros. They still work. They've been around for a while. And even today, um, when you, I, I like to do tests with macros where I just will attach it and see, let the, the uh, email systems uh, antivirus filter scan it and see if it detects it as malicious. And one thing I've noticed is that simple uh, string concatenation is usually enough to get it around those filters. So if you're taking like the word exec and doing E plus X plus E plus C, for example, that will get around a lot of the filters. We'll look at an example uh, a little bit later for that. Um, no gatekeeper concerns, but as I mentioned earlier, it is sandbox, meaning you have limited disk access and limited functions or, or binaries that are available to you. You can still access things such as like OSA script, curl, screen capture, Python. So still a lot of potential there. And uh, Adam Chester, who's currently at TrustedSec, did a blog post a couple years back where he looked at entitlements that Office products had, and he found that they had one entitlement to, dry, to drop files outside of the sandbox if the file name was prepended with a tilde dollar sign. So really good research and that technique still works where you can drop files on disk outside of the Mac OS sandbox using that technique. A colleague of mine, uh, Madov Bat, who's also the Credit Karma, he recently published a sandbox escape where essentially you create a Z, S, H, E, and V file that executes a payload. You zip it and for that zip file, you prepend the tilde dollar sign in front of it. You drop it to the user's home directory. You add it as a login item and then on reboot, uh, when the user restarts, the login item ex extracts the zip file, drops the ZSH ENV file to the user's home directory. And then when the user opens a terminal, you have non-sandbox uh, callback to your server. So um, 
definitely check it out. A, a very informative blog post and does still work. Some uh, example office macro generators for Mac OS. Macfish has been around for a while. And honestly, that's where I learned. I, I, I took a lot of my cues of how to write uh, macro generators from Macfish. Uh, it's got a lot of cool options where you can generate um, office macros that use Python or curl or OSA script or combinations of them. Um, I also wrote a couple macro generators as well uh, for Mythic that uses curl and OSA script. And I did my own for Mac C2, which is a uh, command and control um, tool that I wrote for Mac OS that leverages Python. I did highlight Python in red because again, Python will be uh, eventually taken off of base Mac OS install. So just, I like to highlight in a red so you can be prepared when that happens, which is why things like um, switching to JXA, for example, is a good option because that, that will be around for a while. Uh, also, when it comes to Office macros, auto open um, subroutine is, is useful so that when the uh, document is double clicked, the, uh, the Office macro can be executed. And here's an example here of how I concatenated like the word Python and the word exec. And you see long strings of base64 characters, or I guess in this case, hex characters, excuse me, long strings of hex characters. And what those do is in this payload that I've written, I basically read from a, I read the actual payload from a file, read it into a long hex string. And now it's just breaking that hex string into smaller chunks. So now I'm going to quickly talk about CVE 2021-30657. This was the bug I reported to Apple this year that was a gatekeeper bypass around the March timeframe. And where the, kind of where the idea for this came from was started thinking about, well, here's the typical structure of app bundles on Mac OS. You have the, the app name, you have the contents directory, Mac OS directory, and then there's a Mako inside of that. So when you double click an app bundle, the Mako inside of it is what executes. And it just has all these other wrappers around it, like info.plist, et cetera. So I started thinking like, what if we put something else here, something that's not checked by Gatekeeper because Mako's are checked, which is why when you download an app from the internet and try to try to execute it, Gatekeeper will pop up. Like if you just try to normally, normally uh, run it. But in this case, what if we put something like Bash or Python in place of the Mako binary since neither of those scripting languages are checked by Gatekeeper? So I did that. That's kind of what led to uh, the bug. I found that it worked and it did bypass Gatekeeper. And I reported this to Apple March, I believe, of this year, and they fixed it in short order in Big Sur 11.3 and in Catalina updates. Uh, from the Apple Security Bounty website, they have a section there for user installed applications and access to sensitive data. $100,000, right? really big bounty payment. But they have a very, you see the two asterisks there next to the first line. Um, I wanted to highlight that because Apple has a very narrow definition of what they consider sensitive data. And in my opinion, it's much more uh, consumer focused versus enterprise focused because they, they only consider contacts, mail, messages, notes, photos, or location data to be sensitive, sensitive information, which makes sense from an individual consumer perspective, but when you're starting to look at Max in an enterprise, like what we're talking about here, Mac OS environments, where organizations have thousands of users that are using Macs and they're doing development and engineering work with sensitive data on the host, this definition certainly should be expanded. And in my case, my app detonated, got remote access, and then I was able to access sensitive data, which is things like SSH keys, AWS keys, uh, Azure, GCP keys, uh, other files in the user's home directory, the user's uh, shell history that contains sensitive information depending on like what they've done. So a lot of different um, pieces of sensitive information that this payload had access to, but because of Apple's very restricted and limited definition, kind of consumer, individual consumer focused definition of sensitive data, I received a tiny uh, bounty payment in this case, nowhere near that 100000 there. So just wanted to point that out for researchers. If you're uh, submitting things to Apple to, to just be aware of that. And the reality is uh, Apple may say that this is the, the small breadth of sensitive data we care about. But from an attacker's perspective, like you may have a, a bypass and you're able to get things that are outside of that window of of Apple in terms of like their definition of sensitive data, 
but it's of it's still sensitive data. And so that can happen in your case as well, where you receive a small bounty payment. So just wanted to give you a heads up with that. Some interesting things about this payload, as I mentioned, it does bypass Gatekeeper and app transport security that we talked about earlier, where the system restricts like what websites an app can talk to or what types of protocols it can talk over. Those things don't apply. Um, also, you'll have access to non-TCC folders, so you'll have the ability to grab things like SSH and AWS keys, et cetera, off the host. And it's very convincing. So as you can see here, uh, just by copying icons over to my fake app, and uh, it's got the OneDrive logo, and it looks, looks pretty close. And so it serves as a really good payload that a uh, user can just simply double click a DMG or zip and double click the app inside of it, and that's it. So it's not no need to right click and do all these other things, which made this a very powerful bypass. And I, in my tests, I did both with trying a shell script at the bottom of the app bundle, as well as having Python at the bottom of the app bundle. And in both cases, they worked because neither Python, Python or Bash scripts are checked by Gatekeeper. So I was able to get a call back in both cases. And here's an example, just kind of walking you through what uh, the payload looks like. And I'm just showing you here that I, that terminal does not have full disk access. It did not have any folder access as well. And Gatekeeper set to App Store, which is the most restrictive level. So just want to show that, that there's no trickeration going on in the background. Here is the payload that pulls down curl or uses curl to pull down the payload and runs it backgrounded. And then there's an OSA script message there, which is a fake prompt to the user saying, thank you for installing this app. So you'll see what that looks like a little bit later. Next, I'm using this Masquerade script. It's an, uh, a slightly modified version of a tool called Appify that's been out for, for years that basically took shell scripts and put them in the bottom of an app bundle structure. And so that's what I did here, just ran um, that Masquerade script and created a fake app that has the structure of an app, but instead of a Mako, it has this shell script downloader at the bottom of the bundle. Now what I'm doing is taking um, the icon from OneDrive and I'm copying it over to remove the default logo in my fake app to make it look a little bit more realistic. And notice that the operating system labels both of them as apps, even though in my case, I don't even have an info.plist there. It just kind of follows the app bundle structure. So now that I have my fake app with the logo, what I'm doing now is, is copying it over to a folder and then I'm gonna go into um, disk utility and essentially create a DMG file to host the app. So that's kind of what I'm doing here. I just moved the fake app over to a folder called hosting, and now I'm um, saving it there, and I'm going to give it a new name called real app. So it'll be saved as real app.dmg. So that's what's happening here. So now that that's done, you'll see uh, real app.dmg was dropped there. So the next step will be to show that when a user, basically to simulate a user downloading it from the web. So I'm gonna host the real app.dmg uh, to a local web server here using simple HTTP server. And that way I can click it, download it. And when I download it, it will have the same quarantine attribute that a user would have if they had to download it, like as part of a phishing exercise, for example. So I just hosted it. Here's me accessing it. Um, here locally, and you can see there's real app.dmg. So just single click it, it downloads to the downloads folder, and now we'll just confirm that the uh, DMG file does have the quarantine attribute that Gatekeeper checks. So we'll take a look at that now. And as you can see, it does have the com apple quarantine attribute appended to it. So now we're ready to take that file that we just downloaded and detonate it and See what happens. So you detonate the DMG. And inside the DMG is the fake app that we created here in the demo. We double click that. Notice no gatekeeper pop-ups anywhere. And as you can see, you got the fake pop-up there that says, thank you for installing this provisioner. The fake's to be from the IT team. And in the background, I get a call back from my mythic command and control server. So again, Apple has fixed this, but I just wanted to show you uh, what the bypass look like when I submitted it to them. Other things to keep in mind from TCC, a lot of this we've already talked about of what's not protected. Another thing to mention is uh, SSH is often 
kind of talked touched on it earlier, but in enterprise macOS environments, uh, SSH is usually running by default on the endpoints. And SSH daemon, it was recently pointed out in the, in the um, Mac security community that the SSH daemon actually has full disk access. So if a machine, if you're on a machine and you have credentials of the user and you SSH in locally, um, using those that set of credentials, you now can have full disk access and bypass TCC. So something to point out there. The quarantine attribute, uh, using curl does not append the quarantine attribute. Just downloading through browsers or through um, like Bluetooth, like sharing files from one, one machine to the next, which is AirDrop, things like that will append it, but using curl does not. So that's something to keep in mind because I use that in my gatekeeper bypass. And uh, from signing a notarization perspective, you could totally sign and notarize your payload if you want in order to um, get around some of the controls. But in my personal experience, I found that it was pretty pretty painful process. And when I did sign and notarize my red team payload, I had about a week before uh, Apple retroactively found it and like um, deactivated the developer account and revoked the certificate. So it's just something to think about. Um, my personally believe it's probably not worth the time since real malware, ma real world malware samples are often using unsigned, non-notarized payloads and social engineering the right click open um, execution of the payload. Uh, once you're on a host, um, lots of different things you can do. You can, again, you can grab the system credentials from the host. So like AWS credentials, GCP, Azure credentials. You can look through a uh, user's bash history. You can look for maybe sensitive files on the system. Sometimes users might save tokens or uh, passwords to a file. Uh, Mango PDF uh, did a really good blog post on cookie crimes, things you can do there with um, for Google Chrome, so definitely check that out. I have a link in the in the uh, resources section later to that blog post. Um, of course, you can prompt the user for credentials. You can do it via OSA script, or you can do it programmatically to not leave any command line um, artifacts. You can also search for uh, other interesting files on the host, and even this file here on the bottom, this login data uh, Chrome database contains a stats table, and that stats table contains uh, the username and the login URL for various sites. And it's, uh, of course, it's, it's unencrypted and you do not need root to read it and it's not protected by TCC, meaning any non-sandbox payload can now read from that table, which means if you already have the user's password, considering oftentimes passwords are reused, that table now provides usernames to try that password against for different sites. Also, if you have root access, uh, you can grab the keychain database and take it offline using uh, forensic tools like Chainbreaker. And so you can gain root access via either installer package, which we talked about that gives you root access because the user authenticates, or if you get normal user access, you can use you can basically prompt the user for credentials. And once you get those credentials, you can then, uh, through tools like Mythic, you can run elevated commands since the user, if you have the username and password, that user is usually root on their Mac. So then you can use that to run elevated commands and pull off the keychain. So something to look at as well. Uh, when it comes to persistence, lots of different options beyond just launch agents and launch daemons, which are probably the most popular for Mac OS. Uh, the Evil Bit did a really good long running blog post on titled Beyond Good Old Launch Agents, which goes, it's like the Mac version of Beyond Good Old Run Key on the Windows side and looks at all sorts of interesting um, persistence options on Mac OS. Uh, Leo Pitt or Doomfist also has a persistent JXA repo looking at JXA implementations of a lot of the techniques that uh, the evil bit talks about in his blog post. I also then took a subset of Doomfist persistent JXA and did some Swift implementations. So I have a repo now called persistent Swift. So you have a lot of different resources there to play with different, uh, to, to look into different uh, persistence options and different implementations for Mac OS. Uh, lots of other options here like Vim, via, Vim plugin persistence, SSHRC persistence, uh, profile persistence, Zorier, Chris Ross, he has a really cool authorization plugin um, that like, he did a lot of research there. So a lot of different options to look into for persistence. So some other attack vectors beyond Mac that you'll typically will see in a Mac OS environment, one being the 
build pipeline or also known as the CICD pipeline. And the way I like to describe it is this is the process that like an initial concept for code goes through from like the initial draft uh, thought or concept all the way through to being customer ready. And it hits various stages and checks along the way. And what makes this so interesting is there's a lot of interconnections here um, across different hosts. So if you can access one of these hosts, chances are you'll get a lot of access. And sometimes your build environment, your, your CICD process will traverse environments depending on what you have implemented in your organization. And as I mentioned, a lot of integrations, like there may be some internal Git integration. And of course, internal Git becomes a target uh, internally because there's ten, there tends to be more trust for your internal Git than your external Git, meaning that since it's internal, people may feel like posting or um, committing secrets in your code is not as damaging. But ironically, that's going to be one of the first places an attacker will look in a tech environment is looking through Git repos. Uh, Jenkins uh, is often common, commonly part of the build process and is usually misconfigured in some way that will allow easy access. And oftentimes Jenkins will contain a lot of different secrets on it, given that it's given its role in the environment. And then, of course, you have workstations where engineers may, may be doing development from their Macs and they have local keys stored there as well. Quick look at Jenkins, uh, two common misconfigurations. This is the first one, allowing unauthentic, un unauthenticated build jobs to be executed. So if this is present in your environment, you can hit the view default new job URL on your Jenkins host, and it will bring you to a page that will allow you to run a new build job, where then you can add a single step to execute a shell. And you put whatever shell command you want in there. It could be uh, like running a, a remote shell, a reverse shell payload. It could be uh, catting out files on a system that are sensitive. It could be querying for metadata service IAM credentials if your Jenkins host is in a cloud environment. And so you execute it and you can see the console output there. So essentially this will allow compromise and access to secrets, which can then be used to pivot to other parts of the environment. Another misconfiguration for Jenkins that's pretty common is the script console page allowing unauthenticated access. So if, you, if this is configured in your environment, you can just hit the script page of your Jenkins console, uh, Jenkins host, you'll be brought to the console, and then here you can run uh, Groovy script and essentially get like reverse shell access. You can cat local files, query for IEM metadata credentials and the metadata service. So all sorts of different things you can do here as well. A few other uh, juicy targets. Uh, of course, internal wiki. So thinking about like all the organizational information, system environment information, credentials that are there that can be leveraged by an attacker. Thinking about your internal ticketing system, like imagine the, the environment information that can be learned there, or processes and um, architecture information. Uh, Slack, of course, we mentioned that earlier. Credentials, keys, VPN profiles, all that stuff can be found oftentimes in Slack. Another one, uh, if you have Docker in your environment, if Docker's configured with unauthenticated API sockets, then those hosts can be hit on port 2375 or 2376, usually default ports. Um, but those hosts can be hit and shell commands can be run unauthenticated on those and potentially extract secrets out from your containers there. Uh, of course, we talked about internal Git. So a lot of different juicy targets once you're in a macOS environment outside of just macOS. And of course, you have cloud hosted. Uh, usually, if you're in a macOS environment, there's going to be a good amount of cloud there as well. And so the entry points for cloud keys oftentimes can be phishing payloads, like grabbing cloud, cloud keys off a compromised endpoint, maybe code internal repos for your internal Git. Um, so like finding secrets that have been committed there. Of course, your build hosts, like your Jenkins as an example, um, sometimes even build logs will write the um, uh, cloud keys that it used during the build. So that's a misconfiguration to check for as well. And it's good, I think, to also test from a blue team perspective to see what your cloud visibility and detection posture is. So can blue team see things like accessing secrets in the environment and using those secrets to pivot, like different post-exploitation examples, like on the AWS side, like looking in Secrets Manager or Parameter Store for additional credentials, which may provide access to like another environment or a higher level of access, assuming into other roles. So maybe um, like an attack, let's say Red Team has access to an AWS role, that role has the ability to assume into another role.
the role that they can assume into has higher privileges. So that would be a form of privilege escalation or lateral movement to see if like blue team can see that, attaching policies to users or roles, all sorts of different things here that can be done. Um, and I think it's worth like running through these types of scenarios proactively or even looking at the MITRE attack matrix for the cloud that they have and looking at some common like privilege escalation and lateral movement techniques for uh, different cloud environments. So other recommendations on the blue team side is I definitely recommend uh, leveraging the Apple endpoint security framework. It's good both from a personal standpoint. So let's say you have a payload, a red team or a real malware sample payload. You want to understand what it does. You can take uh, Patrick Wardle's uh, process monitor or file monitor that, that he wrote and you can take it on a sandbox uh, Mac OS system, detonate it, and then you can look at the endpoint security framework logs. It's almost almost like the equivalent of a sysmon for, for Apple or for Mac OS. So definitely check that out. And then you can look for things like suspicious command line executions, uh, persistence methodologies. We talked about repos that you can use there. Parent-child relationships. So things like an office document spawning Ben SH, for example, that would be something to key in on. Of course, um, network detection. So looking for one host accessing one or many ports on multiple hosts over a short period of time might indicate like scanning or sweeping activity. Of course, identity as a service abuse. We talked about Octa One login. So being able to see if you have the ability to see compromised tokens. And if so, do you have the ability and procedures in place to revoke those tokens? Uh, of course, Jenkins abuse, so getting visibility into script console abuse or build jobs running suspicious shell commands. And then within uh, cloud itself, like AWS or GCP, for example, looking at your common post exploitation and privilege escalation methods and auditing. You could even proactively audit your roles and see what, like, you can work with, um, I guess, if you have a cloud security team, you all can work together to see what the state of your current IEM roles are what roles they can assume into and look for like easy privilege escalation paths and see what can be done to reduce those paths. Lots of different resources here. Lots of cool people have done a lot of awesome work in the Mac OS space. So this is not all inclusive, but just wanted to shout out some good resources for people who are interested in delving more into these topics. Uh, definitely check those out. So uh, thank you all for listening. Appreciate it. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out.